You all know that story of the squirrel, you know, in Sunday school, and they say, you know, what's brown has a tail, and, and they sit there and they say, I don't know, but I'll say Jesus because he's the answer to every question. Well, um, actually, I think Jesus is the answer to that question, too. When I think about why mobilize young people, I think Jesus. When I was about 22 years, years old, a mentor of mine said, uh, did you know that probably most of Jesus' disciples were teenagers when he called them? And I said, you're kidding me. They don't look like that at all in the pictures. You know, they got the big beards and everything. And I said, no, no, that, that can't be. Explain that. And he said, well, uh, do you know there's only one that's recorded as having a wife? Peter he talks about his mother-in-law. For the rest of them, there's no record uh, of their wives. And then he, he talked about the fact that uh, look at when Revelation was written, the last book in the Bible, 96 A.D., uh, when you realize that Jesus was born probably in about 4 B.C. Jesus was born before Christ. And then, uh, th so that means that, uh, that when John was called, it was uh, maybe about uh, 27 or something like that. 96, we're, we're talking a period of, okay, do the math on that. 96 minus 27, we've got, what, 60 years or something like that. Um, is that six or seven years? I, could, I always get the math out of here. Do, do the math for me. So is 70 years. Okay, actually, yeah, 69 years. So that means that if he was 18 when he first got to know Jesus, he would have been 87 when he wrote Revelation. That's, that's amazing. If he was 17, he would have been 86. So he had to be a, a young man. And then someone showed me something just a couple years ago that I, I had never seen. If you get your Bibles, turn to Matthew 17. This is, this is really fascinating. Matthew 17, 24 through 27. And this is about the temple tax. After Jesus and his disciples arrived in Capernaum, the collectors of the two drachma tax came to Peter and asked, doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? Yes, he does, he replied. When Peter came into the house, Jesus was the first to speak. What do you think, Simon, he asked, from whom did the kings of the earth collect duty and taxes, from their own sons or from others? From others, Peter answered. Then the sons are exempt, Jesus said to him. But that so, so that we may not offend them, go to the lake and throw out your line. Take the first fish you, you catch, open its mouth, and you will find a four drachma coin. Take it and give it to them for my tax and yours. Now, did you notice that the first of the passage, who is Jesus with? And Jesus and his disciples arrived in Capernaum. And it goes right on into it. And only two of them are required to pay the tax. Because the, the Pharisees come and say, don't you, don't you pay the, the tax? Well, now take a look at, um, at Exodus 30. This is just really fascinating. Uh, Exodus 30, verse uh, 13 14, he talks about they have to give a half shekel. Half shekel is an offering to God. That's basically a temple tax. They, they raised it later because then it was two. But look at verse 14. All who cross over those 20 years or more are to give an offering to the Lord. You're required to pay the temple tax if you're 20 years and, old, and older. And it looks like, now we can't say absolute for sure, but it looks like only two of them were required to pay the temple tax, Peter and Jesus. Wow, that's fascinating, isn't it? Now, again, we can't argue that 100%. But it just seems like that they were young. So let me just ask a question. Why would Jesus mobilize people in mission? He could have mobilized anyone, and he chose to mobilize young people into mission. Why do you think he did that? They haven't figured out all the things they can't work yet. They think everything can, and they can do it. Yeah, so passion. Okay, so you have a lot more. Once they learn, you've got a lot more time for them to actually, actually execute. So, so the same investment will pay off for a lot longer. Okay, what else? So they, they're not going to be, oh, I already know it. They're going, to be, they're going to be teachable. They're going to be ready to be dependent. And maybe even they're going to not be tied to a lot of other people yet. He's going to get their full attention because you get people older and they have, uh, well, they're, they have the demands of their family, their job, their loyalties here and there. And you're going to maybe get this little slice out of them. But the ones who are ignored, the young people, you, you, you might get all of them, which could really means something down the road. Any other reasons why mobilizing young people into missions? Into mission. 
flexibility. Yeah, they learn so much faster. You don't have to unlearn, you just learn. And you tell a young person to do it this way and they don't have to say, no, I've got my way of doing things that they go, thanks, okay, go. They just go, they can go so much faster. So, uh, so now they had to leave their nets and their fathers, but it looks like they were able to make that decision in, in just a few moments where someone farther on extracting themselves, you can say, I need, I need some more of your time. Well, it's gonna take me about two years to free up that time. And, and they're, just, you know, they're just right there. And so they're going, to, they're going to be thinking differently about reaching their generation. They'll, be, they'll just be thinking differently about it. They'll, they'll have different words, they'll have different ways of saying it. Um, and it was already mentioned about the response of, a, of young people. That the question was, how many of you trust Christ as a young person? Statistics say that 90% of those who trust Christ do so before their 21st birthday, 90%. So if you can mobilize young people into mission, and that mission, part of that mission is reaching their generation, um, then, then you can have you know, massive evangelistic fruit for the same kind of, kind of investment. In fact, as I, as I work with churches across this region, some of these churches I've been working with for, for now 20 or 25 years, and in the church, uh, it's like the health of the the, the, the mission focus of the youth ministry, how young people were mobilized into mission, creates growth rings in the church. So if you, if you see a, a large generation in their 30s, just back up 10 years and you'll see a healthy youth group that was focused on mission. And it leaves growth rings. It leaves whole generations that then will, will go through the whole, you, you'll see it 40 years later sometimes, you'll see a, a strong generation in their 60s. Oh, it's because there was a youth movement 40 years ago. And it just leaves these generational. So sometimes we're working down the stream trying to undo what's been done. If we would go upstream and catch that young generation and mobilize them, then you just let them come down and into positions of leadership, and they can, they can I believe, change whole countries. So for, from my standpoint, mobilizing young people and, and into mission is, is so crucial for the health and future of the church. And, uh, and I don't even think we think young enough. I thought uh, Amy's... Talk, that was an inspiring talk last night. I loved what she did. This sets us up so well for today in so many different ways. But you, would you think about mobilizing an 11 year old into mission? You know, would, would you really think that he could lead 50 of, of his kids? Often we just do not understand the potential of that generation. We don't release them. We, we, uh, and sometimes we wait too long. So, um, so I just believe that there's just a huge, uh, huge potential. Because we've, we want to see Europe reach for Christ. There's just lots of, lots of people in this area of the world. This is a crucial area of the world. I really think mobilizing the young generation, the next generation, is, is key to doing that. Uh, you know our region, how small the evangelical population is. And, 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 uh, uh, and let me just tell you a little bit about what we do so that you have a context for the other things I'm going to share. Um, I lead a ministry called Josiah Venture. Josiah gets its inspiration from King Josiah, who started seeking the Lord when he was eight years old. Uh, he, he became king when he was eight years old. He said in the eighth year of his reign, he started seeking the, the, the God. Uh, that means 16 years. And the God of his father, David, which his father wasn't David. His father was Amnon and his uh, grandfather, he just had, he had really poor parent and grandparent. But he was able to skip those generations and tie into a generation much, much higher than him. And then in the next, between 16 and 26 years of age, uh, he rebuilt the house of God, uh, restored to the word of God to a central place and brought revival to his land, three R's. And so that's our inspiration is how do we find those young Josiahs who are seeking God at 16, even maybe in non-Christian families, and have the potential of turning their countries back to him. So this is, this is our vision. And our mission is how do we equip young leaders to fulfill Christ's commission, the Great Commission, through the local church. And so you see some convictions that are important to me. Disciple making, local church. How do we think of evangelism in ways that actually uh, fill and equip the local church and about that young generation? Um, our ministry started in 1993 in two places, Czech and Poland. That was the entire team in 1993. That's me, just a lot younger. And uh, this is our team today. So we have 350 full-time staff serving in 14 countries, <coughs> equipping in a, in a typical year about 6,000 leaders across the region to, um, to accomplish that work in local churches. So um, this is, this, we've got work in these 14 countries. And this is our target, you know, that... that Young, young person with a lot of energy, they're hope-filled to the future, uh, they don't know what to do, but they're ready to do it, even though they don't know what to do. 
Uh, so one of the things we often talk about is, is mobilizing young people in the mission is really about mobilizing them into disciple making. And we have to keep uh, all the whole disciple making continuum in mind as we mobilize them. That really we see five challenges of Christ. He said, come and see. And he said, repent and believe. Follow me. Follow me and fish for men and I will, I'm sending you. And so as we're, we're really mobilizing them in four or five, challenge four or five, but we have to realize we're mobilizing them into this whole continuum. So we're not just mobilizing them into evangelism. We're mobilizing them so they can be good at come and see, so that they can, which is exposing people to the gospel. They can be good at repent and believe. They immediately know then how to follow up other people. So as you're mobilizing four and five, you're mobilizing them into that whole process. So actually, as we're mobilizing young people in the mission, we, and this is one of the things too, they, uh, they need simple ways of understanding what they're going to do. Uh, and they need to be simple and quick and not too complex. As life goes on, we tend to make things more and more complex and more and more complicated. How, how do you just say, uh, I want you to make disciples. Here's the five challenges of Christ. And here's where you are. Here's where you want, we want you to go. Let's, let's just go at it. So this is one of the central things. We, we actually, as we mobilize, talk to them a lot about that. And that really is expose, evangelize, build, equip, send, that whole disciple-making process. And then, uh, just to give you a context, and this is more of a cultural thing, in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, we've found five highways that are particularly effective to mobilize people into mission on. So uh, if I want them moving and taking other people, I could just say, uh, get out there and move and take other people, and I, I could grab five of you and we could start hiking through the woods. Uh, but if I can say, here's a bus and here's a highway and uh, drive to Warsaw or something like that, we're just going to make so much more progress so much faster. And highways are cultural pathways that are already built into our context that are amoral. You can use them to carry drugs or to bring the gospel. But if you get on a highway, you just go so much faster. And so one of the questions we ask is, what is already built into our, our setting that we can do mission on and we can mobilize into mission on? And I'll give you the five that we mostly use. Uh, one of them is, is actually in not in every, not in UK or someplace like that, but in many of the countries over here, English is still a very interesting thing for young people. Their parents want them to master this language. It's going to be the, the ticket to the world. And often uh, we, can, we can get people together for, say, English camps or uh, things like that, which, um, which, and we don't even always have Americans teaching those, but English is kind of that international language. And um, I'll tell you in a minute about some of those schools. Uh, they're already gathered in schools. So they already spend 20, 30 hours a week. How do we mobilize young people in the mission using the place that young people are already gathered, which is schools? Uh, so sometimes we think so hard about how to get people in one place together and build relationships. Well, the government already does that for us. They put them in schools and they have to be there and they're in classes for maybe a year or two. So the relationships are already there. So whenever we can come into that relational network with the gospel, in that place where they're already gathered, that we just go so much faster. That's going to be a, a highway. Uh, another one is music. Uh, the language of young people is always music, and every generation has their music. They love to listen to it. They love to produce it. Their stars do it. Uh, so if we help them become better musicians or use music or use the, the context of music, to do mission and to mobilize and to make disciples, we're just going to go so much faster. Sports. If they're not interested in music, they're interested in sports. So um, there's some, uh, maybe a little bit later, I'll tell you some stories of how just very simple ways of, of, uh, of using this medium of sports to mobilize young people into mission because they, they just enjoy that already. And, and the last one is media. Um, they, uh, young people spend 40 to 50 hours a week connected to some form of media whether they're texting on their smartphones, working, you know, do, sending something, uh, doing something on Snapchat, watching a, a short video on YouTube, and how do we use those channels, and again, not, and even not in, in simple ways, even not complicated ways, and, and mobilize them onto those channels. So how, do, do we teach young people to use their Facebook to share Jesus with their friend or something like that? How do we mobilize onto the highways? So now one of the things you'll see, and this, this is important with this young generation, is, is things have to be quickly comprehensible to them and, and clear. Uh, they're used to picking up something and having it immediately work. 
You know, you press this button and this happens. And again, part of what we have to do, so we say, hey, we got five highways we want to mobilize you on. We got five challenges of Christ we want to mobilize you down. Oh, okay, I got it, let's go. And then we can talk more about, about um, how you specifically do that. So let me, let me just give you, and then on all this, we're trying to equip the local church. So we're not just mobilizing young people, just, hey, a young person anywhere connected to whatever. We know if, if for this to have long-term fruit, We've got to always be thinking, how does this equip the church? How is this connected with local churches? Because otherwise we mobilize a bunch of people in a mission, and then the minute it's done, it's just gone. You know, the, the, the church is, is the, the you know, it's, it's, it's God's family. It's, it's a place where that all is supposed to happen. And I think a lot of people who mobilize young people in the ministry, they mobilize young people in the mission, and then they go, oh yeah, how do we get them into church or get this connected? That's the last thought. Uh, church, the church is a place to mobilize them out. We, we have to have that just in mind the whole. How does this mobilizing young people in the mission actually result in stronger churches that are equipped to do it uh, without us even there? So let me just talk, give you some examples of some of the ways we're doing some of this, and then I'll, I'll talk about some principles. So, uh, for instance, uh, English. This is, um, we kind of stumbled across this 22 years ago. It was totally by accident. I was teaching in a high school in a town not very far from here, about an hour away, and uh, was building relationships with young people, thinking, how in the world could I get them into the church? I got all these relationships, and the church is so far away, uh, not distance-wise, but cultural-wise. And then uh, I asked one of them, what are you doing this summer? And they said, nothing. I said, what do you mean? Yeah, I can't get a job. Or, and they said, you know, under communism, we all used to go to camp, but all those camps have, have fallen away. And then one of them said, so this was an idea from one of the students, he said, if you did a, an English camp, my parents would let me go there and pay for it. You know, there has, there, there has, the, the parent has, a non-Christian parent has to have a reason to send their kid there. Uh, and he said, he said, even if you talked about God, because I was always talking about God. So uh, in, in uh, 1994, so a bunch of years ago, we did our first English camp with about four weeks of preparation, and, and we had a little youth group of uh, about seven people, and so we borrowed some Christians from another church, and all of a sudden we had 80 people at this camp. You know, it just went boom like this. And then afterwards, I said, "Come over to our house. We're doing something every week where we're going to talk about God and study the Bible." And at our first meeting, we had 60. So we went from six to 60 in just about one. Now they were all non-Christians, which it's a, you have a youth group of non-Christians, and it's a mess. So <laughs> it actually took a while. We actually pulled it down to a group of about 40. But uh, that year we did one English camp, the next year we did three, the next year we did seven. We've done, uh, since then, since 1994, we've done 1,300 week-long English camps with uh, 75,000 young people that we've had at, at those camps. But to do that, this was last year, and actually they're not all English camps right now, but they're, um, they're, uh, we did 120 camps with, uh, with about 2,700 non-believers, but this, this will be the thing that's interesting to you because we mobilized 1,000 young people into mission to actually do these camps. So these, they have several sides to them. They're, they're, they're reaching a lot of non-Christians, but they're mobilizing. Those 1,000 young people are getting mobilized into mission and taught how to share their faith in, uh, in really transformational ways. And uh, there were almost 600 professions of faith, 21% of the non-Christians made professions of faith in Jesus Christ at the end, which is just super exciting to me. So, uh, but there's, there's several aspects of this. One is we're trying to make those local churches successful. We're, we're doing things in, in smaller relational ways, but, uh, but trying to, try to mobilize those 1,000 people. That, these are people that actually come in and join the church, and these are believers in the church, that this group together gets mobilized to reach this group. And then uh, and one of the exciting things is then when someone trusts Christ, the follow-up mechanism is already right there. But this is just this one example of how young people can be mobilized. These are, um, oh, these are all uh, these are all college students. We'll, uh, a week from now, I'll have I'll have five days with 110 college students that we mobilize into three months of service in the summer, and um, there there they are. They're actually from a bunch of different countries, and um, we we train them. And then we send them out, and they spend the whole summer helping these local churches. They'll do probably three of these camps, but it's life-changing for them. And uh, actually, this is like this guy right here uh, was uh, my son led him to the Lord when he was 15, and uh, now he's now he's going into full-time full-time Christian work. So it's just really fun to see. He's right from from our church, about an hour from here.
um, is that you know, the question is is what's one of the difference is to is to try to see because sometimes those can be to show the health of the team or something like that. Um, the uh, Czech is a harder soil, so we're starting with it's the most atheist country on earth. Usually takes lo longer, and um, but I would say I would say sometimes we get we get uh, generations of leaders that get uh, that get more cautious about the gospel, and you can see it show up here. And so one of the things we have to we have to teach them is it doesn't matter your setting, it doesn't matter how hard the soil is. You go and just expectant that, that this will bring fruit. Because at the same time in the Czech Republic, we have another one of the highways, the schools highway, and we have a team that's going through the schools. And uh, they they did one one year where um, where they they went around through all these schools. They had 60 professions of faith. Last year they had 600. They've seen 10 times the growth with not much growth in actually what they're doing. And the main thing was the team started getting bolder and, um, and, and less cautious, which is, which is really interesting. And so they started, um, so you can see some of these things. That's one of the things we do, which I'd encourage you to do, track things because you, you spot trends. And instead of just like this feels this way, you can go, guys, look at, you know, you're, you're dropping. What's going on? So I would say actually we're working on correcting that number there. But uh, what, the, what, the, what the Czech team did in the schools was they realized that they weren't actually making it hard enough. They're, so they, they started just being like they, they'll do these concerts, they present the gospel, and then they say, uh, they say uh, who wants to respond and put their faith in Christ? Put your, raise your hand. No eyes closed, no anonymous card. I'm there with all my friends, raise my hand. And they, young people are doing it. And then they say, now go to the room beside here, those who raise your hand. They go through the gospel again, and they say, if you got here by mistake and you really don't want to do this, please leave now. And, uh, and then, they, then they say, okay, the rest of you are here. We're going to pray, and I want, I'm going to pray. I want you to pray out loud after me. And they lead them, and, and so you have these, these young people praying out loud. And then as soon as they're done, they get them packed, get them in touch with the local church. So it actually made it a lot harder but it's kind of the expectancy that God will work, that, that faith step. And, uh, and they're just seeing, they're just seeing amazing fruit. Nineteen young people trusted Christ last week at one of these. So that's, that's been, that's been, and you have churches going in, we'll, we'll do this through local churches, and we'll say, let's go into the schools, people are going to respond. They're going to say, no way, no, not in my town. You know, no, no, this is the Czech Republic, people are not open here. Yeah, it's, God has his heart. The harvest is ripe, we're not seeing it. And that's one of our messages is, is um, you don't see Jesus in Samaria. You know, no one's going to respond here. And yet he leads the woman at the well. And then the whole, you know, they, and he says, lift up your eyes and see the, 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 the harvest is ripe. And that's one of the things we try to do is say, you don't see it, but the harvest is ripe. Get your eyes up. It can happen. Well, that's, that's one of the things. If you're going to mobilize in a mission, the mission is not just an evangelistic mission. The mission is a disciple-making mission. You have to care about the whole, whole mission. So part of it is we work for two to three months before we do the camp with the church, getting them ready, and we get them ready for their follow-up. They're, they're often thinking, I just want to get ready for the camp, and we say, no, actually, the whole thing is designed for that young person who trusts Christ or is interested in God and what you do afterwards. And then one of the things we do is we actually do a survey at the camp where, where students will say, uh, this, is, uh, this, is, this is what I thought of the camp, and then we say, what do you think about Jesus? And then we say, where you were at before the camp, where you're at afterwards. I didn't believe Jesus exists, now I do. Or I put my faith in Jesus Christ. Or I'm interested, and it's actually a pretty, pretty detailed survey. And they get done, and they have information on every single student who was there and where, where to go with the next step. So, so we're really trying to, to make sure that we're, we're doing that whole... Dis and, then, and then some of them do a good job of following up and some of them don't. You know? So that's where uh, we're really pushing on them to do that. But we try to put all the tools in their hands so that they know, okay, Honza said he made a profession of faith at this camp, and you've given me the follow-up tool to, to told me exactly what to do. We have, a, we have a particular tool for those who say, I want to learn more. It's called Look. It's a four-week study that a 15-year-old can do with their friend. Uh, we have something called Grow, which is for someone who trusted Christ. And so we try to just put those tools in their hands. And that's part of mobilizing the young generation. They've got all the passion to, to do it. We often have to put the tools in their hand, and the tools have got to be simple, and they have to work. And so um, that's actually one of our challenges, continuing honing our tools, making them more simple, and making sure we've got the bugs worked out so that they really work. Um, and then they'll do it. They'll, they'll go and do it. So we have one of the things with look is we're in like six generations where you have someone who's 16-year-old 
who's, who's leading some of the Lord, and, he, and, and you know, it's like six generations of young people um, that they're, they're still, they're still in, in high school. Yeah, often the biggest challenge is not bringing them to Christ, but then getting them integrated in a local church. Like that can be even a bigger challenge than getting them to Christ. And so, and you don't, you don't get it done all, I mean, so you, you don't, they don't all get there. They didn't even all get there with Jesus, but you always want to be saying, that's why you've got to see that whole disciple making continuum. We actually want to get them to reproducing disciple makers. So not just into to the church, but sharing their Christ with their friends, discipling others, and being able to go anywhere and walk with him. And you always have to keep that whole, whole continuum in mind. And that's the hard work. That's, that's where um, it's, it's easy to skip and just mobilize into evangelism and not mobilize into disciple making. That's right. And they raise their support. We, and we have, okay, Tomas right there is Czech, and he, uh, he raised almost 2,000 euros to be a part of that. He stepped out in faith, which is really cool. Uh, no matter what he does, he's going to be a giver later on if he did that. He's, his own faith was... Uh, so. But part of it, and here's one of the things, is, is part of it is you, you, you have feeder systems. So um, what happened was we have, we have 110 serve all summer with us. We have about 900 serve two weeks with us. And often those are 15, 16-year-olds. They all come in groups with their youth leader. A lot of these came for two weeks, and now we've got them for three months. So what you try to do is you try to build, build stairs. So if you, have, if you have a step this big, I'm not going to take it. But I can get to the same height in three steps. So sometimes what we have, we, we find no one's coming. We need to take the same challenge and turn it into three steps instead of one and say, come with us for a week. Now, you know, now come with us again for a week. Now come with us for three months. And actually, we get a lot of staff out of that. So I'd probably say half of our, we have 350 full-time staff, probably half of them did an internship with us, maybe two-thirds. And so, so you have those steps. So you go, well, we need full-time staff. Where do we get them? That's here. You know, come with us for a week. And, you, and then you start, start working, working up. So if you see that continuum, um, then, the, then, that, then that grows. Okay, let's, let's, uh, what motivates young people into, into mission? And we can actually come back to the other highways if you want to look at any of the other ones just for some principles. But here's something that's really important. We, we grow out of our youth years and we forget what we were like as a young person and what motivated us. And young people are motivated. I'll tell you their first motivator. Always, 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 in every generation, it's relationships. You get out of that period and you forget that. You become motivated by goals and concepts and ideas. Young people, the first question they're going to ask, actually, if you talk to a, like a 11 to 13 year old, if, if you say, come to camp, their first question is, what are we going to do there and is it going to be fun? But if you get 13 years old, the first question they're going to ask is, who will be there? Who's going? It's all about relationships. And they'll actually hang out under a bridge in the rain and think it was the best day in the world if they're with their friends and they feel like they're a part and that they were loved. It's all about relationships. And so you just, you just have to realize that it starts and ends with relationships. So if you try to, to, to mobilize and you're not thinking about that, uh, you, you just won't get them. So um, now it's hard for us to, to think in that way. Now part, part of it is the relationships that leaders build. But, but the other thing is if you build relationship, if you build a relationship with someone who has a relationship with them, but you're thinking about the, the, the relational stream, then, um, and that's what happens often in youth ministries, is there's someone who has a lot of friends in the school who comes to faith in Christ, and you know this person, and they know those people, and it's all through these, these relational channels. So, um, um, and Evie knows this well, because she's an incredible networker in relational relationship building. That's one of the reasons God's so used her in youth ministry. It just has to be relational. So in all of this that we're doing, we're, we, we, we first put on a relational hat and go, okay, what are the connections? How can they be real? How can the whole thing build relationships? How can they feel relationally connected? Because if you don't do that, the best program in the world, the coolest graphics, the greatest vision will just not work. They live in a relational world. They're, what, what they're doing is they're pushing off from their family and finding a new context, and it's their gang. You know, it's... So it's more than just one relationship. It's the relational family that I feel part of. And uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a web of relationship where I feel known and at home. 
And, um, and it, it, it's because, okay, I, I, I'm becoming an adult, push off from family. Now, family is still really important, but they push off into this relational context and try to figure out who they are. But it's, it's very much about this relational context. I've done, I did my master's thesis on spiritual development in, in young people. And, um, and I ask a lot, of, I'd say, who's your favorite teacher at school? And they'd say who it was. And I'd say, uh, why? Well, because they're my friend. So it's nothing about this great teacher. It, it was all about, um, uh, I, I went to this youth group. Why, why do you like going there? Well, because I just, that's where my friends, I really feel lo- at home, loved. They're always talking. They'll talk about their relationship with God. Why do you follow Jesus? Well, I know he loves me. And, uh, and I just, it's in those years, everything goes into a relational file folder. And so you have to create and maintain and watch those relational file folders. Otherwise, you're not going to motivate them I- anywhere. So there's a lot of things we do in this. That, that's one of the reasons why, by the way, we do our camps, 60 to 80 people. Because it's enough people to create the energy. And it's not too many, so they'll be anonymous. So we, we reach 5,000 young people in the summer. We don't reach them with a huge festival because people, then we'd have to really work the relationship, particularly all these non-Christians. So we can do it with 60 to 80. And then the other thing is it's half non-Christians and we get the non-Christians bonded together like the team comes over. They all spend two days together, so they're bonded. And then they just carry the camp forward relationally. But all those, you're always watching all those relational dynamics and, and, and managing them, and that's what will make things work or not work. Yeah, there's different, uh, this was one of the things that I, I studied when I did my master's thesis. There's, okay, what's, what's the different ages? Yeah. Um, the, uh, there are different developmental phases that you go through. Uh, uh, developmental psychology has done a lot of work in this. Um, the, the, the period of about... Uh, um, you know, about seven to about 12 or 13 is all organized around events, what we do, cause and effects relationships. So if you want to reach, that's why Oana is so great. It's all so concrete. I get points, I win, you know, we do things. It's all activity oriented, that works great. Oana keeps trying to extend into, into high school ministry and they just don't do a good, when you hit the next one, it's all organized around relationships. And that's about 13 to, now the boundary of that on the upper end is, is, is is flexible. Sometimes people move out of, it, out of it as early as 19, sometimes 21. Sometimes there's adults that never move out of that. So, um, so that's not, you, you generally, you rarely find an adult in stage two, which was the one I talked about, the event, the concrete organizing, but you find a lot of adults in stage three. Uh, usually people don't move till stage four until they're probably 19. 19 would be probably the earliest. So you'll find your mid to late college students more moving into, into that. So actually, as we do this, this training now, they're still very relational. Um, we, we do um, the, the, the ideas that we're centered around and the, the, the goal and vision that we have becomes more important to them and maybe even can supersede relationships as they get into you know, mid, mid-university period or a little bit later. Um, so that's, um, yeah. What's that? Stage four is organizing around concepts and ideas. So in stage four, people, that's where, where apologetics becomes really important. Actually, in stage three, they're relational apologetics. My, what my friends think, you know, uh, more, more than logical. Here now, I'm trying to get all my boxes straight, figure out how everything fits together, what categories. Um, systematic theology becomes interesting. It's not particularly in stage three. Uh, they, become, they can become very boxy. But it's more, more there than I, I figure out my ideas and then I choose my friends based on what I believe. Uh, in stage three, I choose my friends and then they choose what I believe. That's why uh, relational contexts are so important during that time. Okay, great. Uh, so the first thing is relationships. There's actually three things. Uh, the second thing is impact. Young people want to make a difference. We heard about that last night. Their ideal is they want to make a difference. And so you, you have to show them how they're going to make a difference, and they have to feel how they make a difference. So it has to go into their hands somehow to where I, they go, what I did changed something. And that's hugely, hugely motivating to them. They don't want to be spectators. They want to be players, and they want to see that what they did made a difference. So uh, that's, the, that's the second one. And then the third one, so there's really three things, is uh, personal growth. They want to grow. So if they go, I'm going to have relationships, I'm going to make impact, and I'm going to grow, they'll, they'll line up to do whatever you, you want to do. If you don't have those, if they aren't growing, 
because they don't have relationships, because they don't have impact. Don't, doesn't matter, doesn't matter. So uh, relationship growth impact. Now, uh, here's something that's interesting. What will catch their attention? This is what will mo motivate them. What will catch their attention? They're very, their attention is caught by stories and by visuals. So you just need to realize that. So you catch, capture their attention by stories and by visuals. So what will motivate them is relationship impact and growth. What will catch their attention is stories and visuals. Okay, this is actually one of the, we produce videos like this to mobilize young people in a mission. So um, what, what, do you, what do you notice about visuals and stories from that? Very simple. Actually, we aren't even talking about what we're doing. Joy, change lives. Yeah. Stories. Stories. And you feel the authenticity, which is really, really important for this generation. Uh, so, so I could do that, and then I could say, do you want to be part of something that will change people's lives like that? Come join us in our English camps this summer. Now, I, I didn't, didn't say anything about, actually, almost every one of those people trusted Christ in English camp. But we're, we're, we're actually trying to get to the core of, uh, let me let me let you feel this generation and feel Jesus is doing something there and that authenticity and that's that's what grabs their and, and simplicity really grabs their heart. So we, as you communicate, you have to think and communicate. We communicate differently than we would we would communicate. Now you just got right to the point. You, a life, Jesus, uh, and that's the kind of thing that captures your heart. Here's another. Um,
But I just want to show you some of the ways that you have to communicate with this generation, visual ways and ways that draw it forward, ways where they see, okay, that's, yeah, that's my generation, I, I can see them, or use the voice of that generation, and then call them to, to a potential vision. Yeah, yeah they, they very much, they much, very much feel that, you know, is that my generation, is that my voice? And, uh, and so we have to get people who are part of that generation to produce these. I couldn't do that. You know, so it needs to be the, their voice. So do we release them? We say, we, we want this to be in your voice. And have, you know, even the coloration of that is, is a particular coloration. It's all D, um, you know, what is it, D, desaturated and all that kind of thing. And, and in five or ten years, it's going to be different than that. So, um, and, and we're going to miss it. I, I won't be able to do it. So uh, we have to say, okay, young people, what's, what's going to capture your voice? Because we're, we're trying to mobilize your generation. Um, okay, here's how do you turn passion into fruitfulness? And, um, and here's just a couple of, of, of quick things that we can come back to. In these train in the trenches. Uh, young people need to be trained, but uh, the training can't take too long before it actually turns into action. And so, uh, oops, let me get to back here. Uh, training has to be fast, and then it has to be followed up quickly with some kind of uh, some kind of action. So what we'll do is we'll say, let's let's do this camp, and then in doing the camp, we teach them how to do it. So throw them in the water, and then teach them to swim in the in the water. And again, as uh, as as older adults, we we want to get everything prepared and it all in line, and get get something. Okay, get them moving before they're prepared. Let them fall, and then teach them to get back up again. Make some mistakes and then teach out of a mistake. But train in the trenches, train in motion, get going and teach on the way. Because um, just think of all the information that's flowing at them. The, the world's information is doubling every 12 to 13 months right now. And they have massive filters up. And the filter is everything becomes spam that's not immediately usable. Now you say all these, all these important things you need to learn well, then create the context that makes them need the information that you're going to give it to them, and then give it to them right there. And then, you know, so say, hey, yeah, in about two hours, we're going to go out on the streets and ask God for an opportunity to talk to someone about Jesus. We are? Yeah, about two hours from now. Okay, so here's how you start the conversation. Here's what you say next. Two hours from now? Yeah, two hours from now. Okay, and then we go out and, and you do it. And that's the, it has to be closely tied to action for them to be, uh, to be interested. So train in the trenches, here's another one. Uh, pave your paths. Often we don't make the path clear enough. They're, they're used to things that work and they won't stay very, it'll be a couple clicks. If it doesn't work, it's gone. So how do you simplify and make the core things that you're doing r really simplified and ready? So that, that's something we're still trying to do. I can show you some of the, uh, we, we try to put tools in their hands that, that work. Or we say, uh, we're going to do English camp. What does that mean? Well, it's six days. It's this. We need you to do this. Here's going to be the outcome. Here's an example of how it works somewhere else. So it's not just evangelize your friends. Go. Or we actually tell them exactly, exactly how to do it. And then, um, and then the, the third one is, is clone your stars. So whenever you see someone who is an example of what you want to do, let them be the voice. Uh, and because, uh, because your front runners will be the ones who, who do the best at doing that. So we've got, uh, we're always looking for who are the examples and then we, we just put them up front. You know, so I, there was a 17 year old who planted a church while he was still in high school. You know, so we get him up to tell his story and give, give a, a, use the voice of that gen generation to mobilize that generation. Okay, so um, train the trenches, pave your paths, clone your stars. Any questions about that? I'm giving you, I can give you examples of any of this, but um, just ask if you have questions about that. Okay, I'm going to keep going. What's the best way to equip young disciples? And this, this is kind of the same question as the one before, but um, I'm back to the question, what's, what's the answer to, you know, Jesus is the answer to everything? And one of the things that we try to do is, is we're teaching disciple making. We actually try to go back as much as possible to Jesus. And uh, I want you to look at Mark right now, um, Mark chapter 1. And um, this is just such a fascinating passage. So um, <coughs> verse 16, as Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew, a couple teenagers, casting an net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. 
When he went a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them. They left. So there's young people. They just, okay, good, we're going. And they followed Zebedee. And then what does he do next? So verse 21, he went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went to the synagogue, began to teach, and there he's he's confronted with a demon-possessed man and casts him out. What you'll find is immediately, the next day, Jesus starts and he takes him on six fishing trips. It's just really interesting in the the passage. He says, I'm going to make you fishers of men, and immediately they start doing it. And he starts training them in motion. So you're training in the trenches, you equip by doing with. So he did, he did it with them, and they just went right into it. The challenge was followed by an opportunity to respond, and then they just got going. And the six fishing trips, he fishes in the synagogue. That's the first one. And then, uh, and then he goes to, in uh, uh, verse 29, he goes to the house of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was, was sick, and he heals his mother-in-law. This is family fishing. And then uh, 32, after the sunset, people brought Jesus all the sick, and he was, that's his neighbor fishing. And then the next day, he, they can't find him because he's in a solitary place praying. And then he says, verse 38, let's go uh, somewhere else to nearby villages. Stranger fishing. And then verse 40, a man with leprosy comes up. Leprosy? Oh, you stay a long ways away from those people. And Jesus says, filled with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. You don't touch a leper. And they're all watching this. Jesus is doing this. He touched it. This is outcast fishing. How do you get to the outcast? And then just a little bit later on, he heals a paralytic. And then uh, in verse 13 of chapter 2, he calls Matthew, the fifth disciple, and then goes to his house and meets with all his coworkers. And this is coworker fishing. Or, or fun. So it's just so fascinating to watch Jesus. He says, I'm going to make you fishermen. And then, boom, they're, they're, on, they're in motion. And so how do we do that with young people? We challenge and then challenge them into motion and, um, and challenge them into various kinds of things. How do you share Christ with, your, with strangers? How do you share Christ with your family? How do you share Christ with your friends? And by the way, I'm going to do it with you. And that's what really makes the difference with young people, is that, that, that doing with. I remember I, I grew up in the church and was very bored when I was 17 years old. I used to sit on the pew and peel off the gum from underneath the pews and make little animals from it. That's what I did. Because there was, if you go under pews, at least in my church, you would find leftover gum from a lot of people. And uh, well, after one service, a, a guy came up to me, and he, his name was Joel. He just started going to his chur- our church, and he said, Dave, I'm starting a Bible study with guys. Do you want to be in my Bible study? And um, you can guess what my first question was. My first question was, who's going to be there? <coughs> right? That's my first question. And he said, well, I've talked to Dan. Oh, Dan's one of my best friends, and I've talked to him. He talked to him. Okay, well, that sounds interesting. I'll be there. So we got there, but he, he did something different. He said, uh, he'd actually chosen us on purpose. And he said, um, I'm only going to meet with you 10 weeks. And you need to write down everything I say, because at the end of 10 weeks, you're going to do this Bible study with someone else. Really? I mean, I'm 17 years old. Wait, yeah, I can't. So, so then, okay, we start writing down. And then he says, now, I want you to make a, a list of um, of the uh, people that you want to pray that maybe be in your Bible study, and I want each f- at least five of them to be non-Christians. We say, wait, non-Christian in Bible study? Yeah, because you're going to share Christ with them. I'm, I'm going to teach you how. Okay, all right. So then the next week, we start praying for the people on our list. The third week, he teaches how to share the gospel, and he says, now, uh, your Simon is one of the people on your list. This week, do what I just taught you to do. And we, we can't do, we can't do, what, how do we do that? He says, tell them you're in a class and you have an assignment and you need their help to do this assignment. And, and, and that they're going to help you do your assignment and you're going to, you're going to, ah. so I, and I, but I did, I shared Christ with my friend. I just peer pressure going on, you know, because I got other friends that are working on this. We're all, and he's doing it too. Joel's doing it too. So we're in the trenches. You see, we're, 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 we're fishing. We're on fish. We're learning how to fish on fishing trips. We came back so excited. We had all these questions. Uh, and then the next week, Joel was teaching at another youth group, and he brought us all along. And he gave an evangelistic message and a, an invitation. And several people came forward. They came forward, and he says, Hey, over here, I want you to talk to my friend Dave, and he'll tell you how you can put your faith in Jesus Christ. What? You hand him to me? Yeah, go for it, Dave. You go. You know, you've done for a week. You're, you're an expert. And do you, do you see that? Where Let's get going. Let's get going. Let's, let's get fishing. And I'll do it with you, and we'll learn on the way. Uh, and then, um, and then, 
about six weeks into things, he says, okay, next week, Dave, you've got to study. What do you mean I got to study? I've only done this six weeks. Well, we've only got three more weeks and you all have to get a practice so that you're ready when we finish this and you start doing it with someone else. See that kind of pushing in, into things? So I did one, he gave me feedback, 10 weeks, it ended. And I didn't start a Bible study immediately, but about three months later, I pulled a group of five guys together and I said, come on here. And they said, now, it's going to be really important that you write down everything I say. Because when we finish this, you're going to need to do it with someone else. And uh, I started my first discipleship group when I was 17. Well, I wasn't ready for that. No, I wasn't ready. But he paved the path. You know, he gave me really specific instructions. He grabbed me. We went fishing together. He taught me on the way. All these different things like Jesus is doing, you, 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 uh, you quit by doing with. And we also talk about tar. If you want something to stick, you need to teach, act, reflect. Teach, act, reflect. This is something that Jesus was always doing. He taught something, then they immediately did it, and then they talked about what they did. And so, um, so this is teach a little, do it, talk about what happened. Teach, do, tar. Or you can act, reflect, teach. You know, you can, but, but it makes things sticky when you, um, when you and that's what Jesus did. So he's our best example. And by, as we're training youth leaders, we're, we're always going back into the gospel and saying, look at that, look what Jesus did. Isn't this amazing? You could do that too. Uh, because we really want them to be centered on Jesus Christ. Now here's one of those uh, tools that I talked about. This is a, a four-week four meet, one-on-one meeting over coffee. It's called Look. What does the Bible say about your relationship with God? And it basically, the first is look at yourself. I don't have the rest of them here. Then look at your biggest problem. Then look at God's solution. Look at what you need to do. It's basically kind of the four spiritual laws in a discussion thing. And we teach young people to do this over coffee. We've had, in fact, in, in Sylvania, our Sylvania team has seen more people come to Christ through one-on-one -on -one times with 16 or 17-year-olds doing, doing this with their friends than anything else. And sometimes we'll see 40, 50 percent of the people who finish four weeks will put their faith in Christ. So are we putting tools in people's hands? Are we telling stories uh, are, uh, and mobilizing them into mission and to, into a, a life of mission? And then uh, how do you build stability and endurance so the disciple-making mission becomes a lifestyle for a young believer, not just a project or one-off experience? I think we have to think. There's, there's three ways to think. You can, you can think like factory thinking, which is all about the system and the structure and the product. The product is camp. You know, how do we get the system and structure to produce a camp? Or you can think uh, like forests, like we just need to hang around with people and let something emerge. Or you can think like a farmer, which is how do we build an environment where something grows and I see the whole thing. And farmers think in big cycles. They have to, in the fall, be thinking about what I do in the fall so that I can be ready for the spring, so I can be ready for the summer, so I can be ready for the end of the summer, which is the greatest time of all. But I only get to the end of the summer, the greatest time of all, if I start thinking in the fall about the spring and about the summer. And so you have to see the big cycles. And so we're always trying to get people up and say, think about the entire year. So you're doing this. Think about the whole cycle of taking someone from unbelief to maturity and, and be working with that whole cycle in mind so that, so that you're about disciple making and not just about evangelistic events. And then you want it to become a lifestyle to where you can share Christ at camp or in, in school or someplace else. But it just kind of, you just start doing that with all of your life. We want to turn out disciple makers who, who are on mission, not just in missions. There's a difference. They live on mission. And, uh, and then this, this particular thing that I've done only equips them for that.